At 0900 hours on Monday the 18th of September 1944, SS Captain Victor Graebner, commander of the 9th SS Reconnaissance Battalion, drives his force across Arnhem Row Bridge from the south. Perhaps thinking he could surprise and shock the British Paris into surrender, his half-tracks and Puma armoured cars rumbled into view of two Paris positions. Graebner's newly earned Knight's Cross reminded him that such tactics had worked before, but sadly, they wouldn't work this time. Yesterday we saw how the initial landings had gone smoothly, but then several things had gone wrong. Frost's men had failed to take the Arnhem Rail Bridge, but had successfully reached the Arnhem Road Bridge, whilst the rest of the division floundered around Oosterby. The 82nd had taken most of the bridges, except for the vital Nijmegen Bridge, and were busy pounding the Reitzwald. The 101st had taken most of their objectives, except for the bridges at Best and Son, both of which were destroyed. But they held the area around Son and could put a Bailey Bridge across the canal once 30 Corps had arrived. And 30 Corps had fought hard to break through the German cross, which had been thicker than imagined. They still hadn't reached Eindhoven by day's end, and they were now behind schedule. But day two was now upon them, and it started with a bang, as Graebner's reconnaissance battalion headed north across the Arnhem Row Bridge. He'd left some self-propelled guns at Nijmegen to help defend there and raced north to Arnhem, thinking only a handful of British paras held the north end of the bridge. He believed a quick attack across the bridge could dislodge the British from their positions. Remember, nobody knew exactly how many British there were, and Gravener thought he was facing a smaller force than his. His battalion, consisting of half-tracks, armoured cars and trucks carrying infantry, drives across the bridge. Some of Graebner's vehicles actually make it all the way across, and things look good until one vehicle strikes a British anti-tank mine, and then all hell breaks loose. Concentrated rifle and machine gun fire from both sides riddled the open half-tracks, killing crew and passengers alike. Mortar fire rained down on the Germans, and grenades were lobbed into the open hatches of the armoured cars. Chaos and confusion disrupts the attack, and Graebner is killed. More vehicles tried in vain to continue the advance, basically feeding the defeat, and it wasn't until midday until the fighting finally came to an end. In two hours, 12 vehicles out of the 22 that took part in this attack burned on the bridge, and the largest concentration of armoured vehicles in 9th SS Panzer Division had been cut to pieces. What this represented was a change in the battlefield. Day one had been about movement, capturing objectives quickly, by surprise, but now the fronts were beginning to solidify. Fluid and daring manoeuvres gave way to positional warfare. Foxholes were dug, lines were forming, positions were taken and fortified. Rapid attacks really weren't going to bring about a victory now. The moment had passed for decisive attacks. It was now going to be an attritional infantry slog. Frost men at the bridge had fought off Graebner's attack, but were not in the best situation. Surrounded by Germans and now short of ammunition, they hoped either First Airborne or 30 Corps would reach them soon. They had to reach them soon. But by this point, 30 Corps hadn't even reached the 101st Airborne Division at Eindhoven, 50 miles to the south of Arnhem. They had a bridge to rebuild at Son. They had a bridge to take at Nijmegen, and time was ticking down. The Germans were now counter-attacking positions of the 101st, and by the end of the day, they had actually retaken the bridges at best and the Wilhelmer Canal. 30 Corps would reach the 101st at Eindhoven by about half 12, and would get to Son in the early evening, where they would found uh, the destroyed bridge. They began to construct the Bailey Bridge that would allow them to continue their advance to Arnhem. However, the Bailey Bridge wouldn't be finished this day with the result that 30 Corps was now massively behind schedule. Equally as concerning, 1st Airborne Division was still miles to the west of Arnhem and desperately trying to break through to 2nd Battalion at the bridge. Before dawn, Fitch's 3rd Battalion, accompanied by General Urquhart, moved from Oosterbeek and gained a mile and a half of ground without much opposition. However, as they reached the western suburbs of Arnhem, they were blocked by Camp Group Spindler. It was at this point that General Urquhart found himself confused in the street fighting, and trying to get back towards Oosterbeek ended up trapped in a house in Western Arnhem. A self-propelled gun parked itself outside his position, leaving the whole of 1st Airborne Division without their leader. Sat with him was Lathbury, who was in charge of the 1st Parachute Brigade, the units that were fighting towards the bridge. Without leadership to organise the attacks, the battalions fighting towards the bridge 
struggled to make any headway. For the rest of the day, 3rd Battalion were pinned down in the street fighting on the outskirts of Arnhem, making very little progress. And by the day's end, only 140 men of 3rd Battalion were left. Further back, 1st Battalion had marched through the night and were now in Oosterbeek. Their commander, Dobby, was not in contact with 3rd Battalion and assumed they had gone on ahead to the bridge. He therefore attempted to march straight into Arnhem. His troops reached the railway embankment at around half five in the morning, but suffered casualties. Knowing his unit would be useless if it didn't get to its objective in one piece, he decided to avoid fighting and turn south. He linked up with stragglers from 3rd Battalion and by about eight o'clock, they had passed the railway line, but were then fired upon by Germans in nearby houses and armored cars at Den Brink. There was now no other option but to fight their way forwards. 1st Battalion, with elements of 3rd Battalion, fought through sniper and machine gun fire to clear out the buildings between them and the rest of 3rd Battalion. Battalion. But by late afternoon, the exhausted powers had only just caught up with the remnants of 3rd Battalion. Despite advanced elements being only around 800 yards from the bridge, they would go no further this day. Back at 1st Airborne Headquarters at the Hartenstein Hotel, things were looking better. Ish. Lieutenant Colonel Charles McKenzie now informed Brigadier Hicks that he was now in charge of 1st Airborne, since Urquhart had disappeared. Urquhart had issued orders that in the event that himself and Lathbury, who was sat in the same house with him, were lost, that, the, that Hicks would be next in line. And then, if Hicks was lost, then Brigadier Hackett would be in command. So Hicks, hearing reports that 1st and 3rd Battalion were struggling to get to Frost at the bridge, decided to send the South Staffords and 11th Battalion of Hackett's Brigade to help them as soon as the 2nd airlift arrived. Remember, not all of 1st Airborne had gone in on the first day. 11th Battalion hadn't even arrived yet, and half the South Staffords hadn't arrived either. A good chunk of 1st Airborne had had to guard the landing zones for the reinforcements that were expected. But these reinforcements were delayed for four hours. It wasn't until the afternoon that the 2nd lift arrived. So the South Staffords went to Arnhem in the morning, taking a similar route as 1st Battalion and managed to catch up to 1st Battalion later in the day. And when the 2nd lift did arrive, Brigadier Hicks informed his technically superior in rank Brigadier Hackett that his 11th Battalion was now being taken from him and sent to reinforce the Arnhem relief attempt. The result? 11th Battalion sat for at least two hours perhaps longer, outside the Hartenstein Hotel as the two brigadiers argued over how 11th Battalion should best be deployed. Hackett, who wasn't exactly pleased that his inferior was in charge of the division, thought that the situation was untidy and had not been informed until now that his own troops were being taken from him. Ultimately, 11th Battalion, commanded by Lieutenant Colonel George Lee, and the second half of the South Staffords managed to reach the west end of Arnhem by the closing hours of day two. So the situation at Arnhem wasn't great, but the good news was that a good portion of the British powers are now in the same area and are about to launch an attack that would hopefully relieve Frost at the bridge. That attack will go in tomorrow. Further to the south, the 101st were now battling against, well, several German units. The previous day had seen only minor skirmishes, but now Student was able to pull in new units and start counterattacking. Student, as you remember, was the leader of the German paratroopers, the Volkschmager, and, quote, I knew more than anybody else that an airborne landing is at its weakest in the first few hours and must be sorted out quickly and determinedly. He therefore threw units at the 101st, even though most were of poor quality, simply because he wanted to hit the Americans early. At this point, his men were trainee Volkschmager and police units, but he knew that the 15th Army was arriving from across the Scheldt. Starting on the evening of the first day, but really got going on the 18th, Kampf Group Rink, the 59th Infantry Division, and the Fulchemega Battalion, Ewald, all struck against the elite American paratroopers. Luckily for the Allies, the attacks went in piecemeal and were therefore beaten back, having little impact on this day. But Student was able to start pulling in the 107th Panzer Brigade from Hellman. This was an entirely different kettle of fish. Armed with deadly Panther medium tank and Panzer Grenadier infantry, this force could overcome the lightly armed American paratroopers. However, it could only move at night for fear of the Allied air attacks, so Student would have to wait until tomorrow, day three, to use them. In the middle at Nijmegen, the 82nd successfully held the Grusbeek Heights overnight against no German attacks, but on the morning of the 18th, the Germans sent in the 406th Division to take the Heights. Except the day before, this division 
wasn't really a division. It consisted of HQ unit and a few training units, but by the 18th, General Scherbening had cobbled together some inexperienced Luftwaffe, eyes and ears battalions, and artillery units, and kind of called it a division. In reality, it was little more than maybe four battalions in strength, and may have been weaker than that. What is certain is that they had very few heavy weapons and many of the soldiers had no practical infantry training. Early on the 18th, this force attacked the elite American paratroopers dug in at the Grooves Peak Heights and somehow managed to take some of the drop zones, killing, wait for it, 11 Americans and wounding some more. But by one o'clock, the second wave of American paratroopers dropped from the skies and coupled with an attack by the paratroopers already on the ground, the German units were routed from the field with the loss of, wait for it, a thousand men killed or captured. This was the only serious attack on the Grooswick Heights in the first few days of the operation and it, it ended in disaster for the Germans. A little to the north, a German engineer battalion of the 10th SS Panzer Division was now running a ferry across the Panadern Canal. Progress was slow, but units were steadily getting across and marching to Nijmegen. Kampf Group Henk occupied positions around Hunter Park and was now being reinforced by half-tracks and more infantry who came across the Wall on dinghies rather than face fire if they tried to cross the bridge. German forces found themselves winning as Gavin had pulled back some of the paratroopers to help at Grusbeek. There was now a lull in the fighting. The Germans gathered more forces and Kampfgruppe Reinhold took up Henk's old positions as Kampfgruppe Henk now moved to secure the nearby railway bridge, which at this point hadn't seen any action at all. Reinhold dug trenches, almost completely unopposed by the 82nd, 88mm guns were positioned across the river, and armoured vehicles moved into the city. Mines were laid, buildings that were in the way of their defensive plans were demolished. The centre of Nijmegen was now fully in German hands, and they, they had the entire day to fortify it. It's worth noting at this point that as day two comes to a close, the situation across most of the battlefield is stable and in Allied control. 30 Corps had reached the 101st and would soon have a Bailey Bridge up and running. The 82nd had successfully held the Grusbeek Heights against the German <coughs> division that hadn't existed the day before and barely existed even now. And at Arnhem, though the British hadn't got many troops at the bridge, Frost's men were dug in and potentially could be reinforced by a large force of British powers who were only 800 yards away from them. And yet there was one vital piece of the puzzle that needed to be grasped. Nijmegen, the only bridge on day two that still hadn't been secured at any point so far. But Nijmegen city was now a fortress and garrisoned by an ever-growing number of elite German SS Panzer Grenadiers. 82nd Airborne had failed to take this crucial objective and as day two comes to a close, and even after additional reinforcements to the 82nd, no effort was being made to correct this issue. The Germans at Nijmegen now blocked the road to Arnhem. Think about it, if the Allies don't take Nijmegen Bridge soon, First Airborne would be isolated and potentially crushed. Without Nijmegen, there could be no Arnhem, and the whole operation would be doomed. If the 82nd had taken Nijmegen and the bridge there, rather than concentrating on the Grusbeek Heights, how would things have played out? Would it have been better or worse than the situation we have now? I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below. Thanks for watching, thanks for subscribing, bye for now.